Well, good morning. Thank you all for being with us this morning. I'm Jennifer Stefani. I'm the executive director with Appleton Downtown Incorporated, and I'm a board member with Wisconsin Downtown Action Council. Welcome today to our conversation on winter placemaking. Um, we all know the importance of creating vibrant and exciting places where people wanna gather and wanna be a part of our community. And winter brings a really big challenge for all of us. However, there are great opportunities for us to embrace new ideas, step out of the box a little bit, put on your warm mittens, and engage in some fun placemaking. So we're gonna hear about a little more on how some other communities are embracing winter placemaking and share some great insight with 880 Cities and AARP. So it's our privilege and honor to be a partner with AARP. And I wanna introduce my good friend, Darren. And Darren and I have worked together for years um, in many capacities and it, it, Darren has been with AARP now for, I believe, three years. I could be saying that wrong. Two and a half. Two and a half. I'm pretty close. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we've, we've really embraced the opportunity to learn from AARP. And if you haven't had a chance to visit their website and look at all the amazing placemaking guides and community development guides that are available there, it's really all about creating livable cities. And it's a, a really exciting time for all of us in Wisconsin to be embracing creating great center cities, especially. So without further ado, um, Darren, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking us into our program. And thank yeah, you so much for sponsoring. Thanks, Jen. So again, as um, Jennifer said, I'm Darren Wasniewski with ARP Wisconsin and one of the two uh, state directors of community outreach. And you know, just background because I think many times when people hear the the uh, acronym AARP, they have this question mark about what does that have to do with making livable communities? And you know, this came out of a 2010 survey um, that ARP did to over its, its over 38 million members and found that over 75% of them wanted to remain in the community as they age. And then we had the startling realization that most communities aren't built to make that happen. Um, not through their housing, their, infra their transportation infrastructure, their public spaces. And so they launched our Livable Communities Initiative. And through that, we've developed great partnerships with groups such as Amanda's 880 Cities um, at a Toronto. And so it's through that that we're able to um, bring them here today uh, we just finished collaborating with them to develop the winter placemaking guide and I think you'll find a lot of value in this. And when we're done, we'll be happy. I'll share a little bit about how you can fund some of those projects in Wisconsin. Um, but in the meantime, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A and we'll make sure that we get them um, answered as they go along. So without further ado, I introduce Amanda O'Rourke with 880 Cities. Thanks so much, Darren and Jennifer. What a warm uh, welcome. Uh, I'm going to start my presentation and see if it works properly. As always, uh, it's always a little slower when in practice session it was fast. Okay, here we go. Uh, yeah, so thank you again for the, the welcome. Um, thank you to the Wisconsin Downtown Action Council and to AARP Wisconsin uh, for the invitation to talk about winter placemaking. Uh, as Darren said, my name's Amanda. I'm uh, the executive director of 880 Cities and I'm really excited to talk about winter. It's actually one of my favorite subjects. Um, and for those who know me, they know that it's my favorite time of year. Um, but even for the reluctant winter lovers out there, I promise there's something in this presentation and this guide uh, for you too. Uh, I am joining from Toronto, Canada, which is the uh, traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people from across Turtle Island. Uh, if you are not familiar with 880 Cities, we are a nonprofit organization. As I mentioned, we're based in Toronto, but we do work internationally uh, as uh, our partnership with AARP brings us to uh, U.S. cities and communities uh, over the last 15 years. 
Uh, and uh, our mission is really focused, and it's a simple one, is to improve the quality of life for people living in cities and communities, no matter their age, ability, or socioeconomic status. We, uh, in a simple way, to achieve that mission, if I had to summarize it in one sentence, uh, we basically bring people together to transform mobility and public space uh, because we believe these are uh, essential to creating healthier, more equitable and more sustainable cities, more livable communities, uh, hence the, the fantastic partnership with AARP. Uh, We've been around for 15 years. We've been doing this for uh, quite a while. Uh, and we've actually worked with over 300 cities on all five continents, uh, sorry, on all six continents. Uh, and um, we are underpinned by this very simple, uh, but we think powerful question. Uh, what if everything we did uh, in our cities was great uh, for an eight-year-old and an 80-year-old? Uh, we've been challenging cities uh, for the last 15 years, asking this simple question, uh, because we believe this is a great starting point uh, to create better cities that work for everyone across the entire lifespan and uh, across multiple social identities. Uh, we are all aging. Uh, every Aging is a universal human experience. Uh, and we know that the important role that social identities play in uh, a person's experience navigating public space. So in addition to age, we're also thinking around race, gender, socioeconomic status, uh, ability. Uh, and we think that the 880 concept and the 880 question is a great starting point uh, to get to a place where we create better cities for everyone. Uh, our work is really centered around reclaiming the right to the city for all uh, and reclaiming the right to mobility, the right to public space and the right to participate fully in our cities, especially to those who have been disproportionately impacted by a very car centric uh, planning. Uh, so we know that uh, a car centric approach to planning has had disproportionate impacts on children and uh, elders. Um, and we believe everyone has the right to be able to move safely and comfortably uh, and uh, healthily uh, in their cities by walking or cycling or using public transit. So what does this have to do about winter? So you know a little bit about uh, 880 cities and our approach. Those three rights are really kind of uh, underpinning our work uh, around uh, public space and improving the public realm. So let's layer on top of that winter. So when we think about the right to mobility, as I mentioned, um, our work is really about kind of decentering uh, the car in terms of mobility and recentering uh, our uh, streets uh, and mobility systems around people. So uh, we know that uh, winter actually exacerbates uh, existing uh, inequalities that are inherent in this kind of approach. Uh, and um, we know that there's also disproportionate impacts on different uh, social locations. So if you uh, are a person uh, who uses a mobility device, uh, if you uh, need some sort of um, mobility aid, uh, if you are a low income resident uh, that relies on a transit system that's not really well maintained, um, if you are a caregiver uh, and, uh, and you're trying to get through the snow. So this is um, a great example of uh, not just the car centric planning um, being disproportionately impacting on different social locations, but also on the opportunity that we have to actually reprioritize people and healthy movement and healthy and active transportation in our communities. Um, we know that when we see bus stops like this or sidewalks that are plowed uh, way after highways or arterials or they're deprioritized, we're basically saying that um, uh, that these are second class citizens, that uh, we, the city is signaling that we don't care as much about you. 
And uh, at 880 Cities, we, we obviously really are trying to get cities to think very differently about how they prioritize active transportation and active transportation and sustainable transportation in winter. Uh, we really kind of designed winter uh, out of our cities uh, or designed our cities even to avoid winter. Uh, so how do we actually uh, get back to creating cities uh, where our movement in winter is pleasant and joyful and uh, accessible? The second right is the right to public space, as I mentioned. So we believe everyone has the right to uh, great public spaces that are close uh, uh, in close proximity where they respond to uh, the unique needs of the community. What we see with applying that winter lens on public spaces uh, is that again, it kind of exacerbates the uh, inequalities in the system. So uh, we see that a lot of cities actually treat their parks, winter cities treat their parks as kind of unofficially closed in winter. Uh, we've heard that quite a bit from parks and recreation departments not a lot of maintenance uh, in the parks in the winter all the time. Uh, not a lot of things to do in the winter, not a lot of active programming. So even on a beautiful day, like the one on the lower left-hand corner picture, the beautiful winter day, there's not a lot inviting people to come out and stay. Uh, we obviously have some uh, maintenance issues around not just the clearing of sidewalks and walkways, but also, again, this mentality or mindset that we can kind of close the parks, we close the washrooms, we close um, the, the, the regular maintenance. And uh, we think that that's such an underused uh, asset in a community. When you think of a winter city, like uh, I know Toronto has quite mild winters, but a city that has longer winters even than Toronto, like many of the cities in, in Wisconsin, when you think about not using a public space for uh, you know three to four months of a year, that is a really um, not a great investment and you're not leveraging as much as you can out of your existing fantastic public assets. How can we extend uh, our use of these uh, existing assets for the betterment of health and well-being in our communities? That's really what we wanted to address uh, when we created the Winter Placemaking Guide. Uh, the third right is the right to participate. Again, these three rights are really what guide us in our work at 880 Cities. Um, our work is really on engaging folks outside of the usual traditional approaches to public consultations, um, because this is a really essential part of placemaking. As I mentioned uh, at the top, uh, our mission and our, our the way that we actually achieve our work uh, is um, bringing people together is the first part of that sentence. And that's a huge part of actual um, getting positive action in communities and, uh, and having um, placemaking that actively responds and winter placemaking that actively re responds to a community's needs. So we do uh, a lot of engagement with communities, especially uh, targeting and prioritizing uh, folks that have been underrepresented in city planning. So we do a lot of focused engagement with young people, with older people. Uh, we pop up in uh, parks and public spaces. We often work uh, with libraries uh, and we really try to get uh, engagement that is fun and bring the engagement back to uh, community engagement. So that's uh, the three rights, but what I really wanted to talk about today, uh, and this is really setting us up to talk about the winter placemaking guide. So given all that we understood in working with winter cities about the, as Jennifer mentioned, the unique challenges that winter cities face and some of the symptoms uh, around the lack of use of public spaces or the lack of activation or the lack of investment in public spaces in the winter time, uh, organized in around those, those three rights, uh, we decided to create a winter placemaking guide with the generous support of AARP Livable Communities. Uh, we are uh, also building off some of the winter work we had done in uh, some of the cities uh, previous to launching this guide, where we had done a number of pilot projects and engagement and strategizing with winter cities. And so this is the, the, the bulk of the resource that I'd really love uh, to share with you today. 
So what was the purpose of this guide? The goals of this guide were really about building excitement about winter. Uh, we wanted to provide evidence to support winter placemaking using an age-friendly lens. We also wanted to provide ideas and tools to implement uh, for communities to implement their own winter placemaking using an equity-based approach uh, and a kind of rights-based approach, as I mentioned, the, the right to the city. And then we also wanted to inspire cities to adopt a winter lens in all of their planning work. So ultimately, uh, you know, in the long term, I think for winter cities, winter should be absolutely integrated as an ongoing element, um, you know, beyond just uh, allocating budgets for, for uh, snow removal of uh, arterial roads. How do we actually really integrate winter into all that we do when we're planning uh, our public spaces? That is the, the goal. So, the guide is actually uh, separated into a number of different chapters. I'm not going over the whole guide. It's a beautiful document uh, and it's free, open source. It's available on the website. I'm gonna share them at the end of my presentation as well. Um, but I'm pulling out kind of the key elements of the guide that I think are um, potentially most useful to the audience and to kind of get us oriented about what is uh, uh, winter placemaking really about. For those of you on the call, I imagine you've been doing a lot of um, place-based work. Uh, I know that downtowns are, uh, and economic development organizations are really immersed in this work uh, on creating more active and social spaces. Uh, so winter placemaking is really like adopting a kind of winter lens on, on placemaking. To me, placemaking at its core is really about strengthening the connection between people and place. And the practice of placemaking occurs when local communities have power, capacity, and the resources to actively shape public spaces in a way that meets their needs and improves their everyday quality of life. And I focus on everyday quality of life because I we really believe that that's like really where you can make the biggest impact on creating healthier, more equitable cities is if you focus not just on the one big event uh, in winter, but thinking about how to improve that everyday experience of winter um, and uh, make it more uh, inviting uh, for people to get outside, be active and socialize. To us, winter placemaking, so in the guide, we actually realized that um, when we created the winter placemaking guide, there wasn't to our um, uh, research an actual definition of winter placemaking. Lots of really wonderful definitions of placemaking out there, uh, but not one specifically about winter. Uh, and it's not rocket science. As I said, it's really kind of adopting a winter lens on an existing amazing body of work uh, around uh, placemaking. Um, and we believe that equitable winter placemaking really is about adopting that kind of intersectional approach uh, to reflect on how different aspects of our social identities overlap, um, as I mentioned, such as race, gender, socioeconomic status, age, of course, uh, and ability. Um, they can overlap to create these spatial barriers uh, that shape our distinct experiences of winter in our communities. But really, a winter placemaking is a means to re-envision um, our public spaces, the ways that our public spaces are created and used in winter in order to foster, as I mentioned, social connection, physical activity, and all of the benefits of a public realm all year round. So if you focus in on winter, if you make the place places great in winter, chances are you're gonna make uh, it better all year round. There are a lot of benefits of engaging in winter placemaking. And uh, I also wanted to uh, specifically mention that in the guide, we also uh, really zeroed in on some uh, case studies and examples from cities of all sizes. So uh, winter placemaking in rural communities and small towns is really imperative to improving the quality of life for older adults 
and we believe it signals a really great commitment to livability in communities of all sizes. Uh, so the benefits of winter placemaking are many, um, but I've pulled out three key ones that we highlight also in the guide. Uh, so when you actually activate public spaces in the winter and engage people in reimagining their public spaces in the winter, and you build more opportunities for social connection in the winter, or you uh, build more opportunities for um, physical activity in the winter, you're actually uh, doing a really great service to health uh, improvement in your community. Um, we know that winter is a time uh, when social isolation uh, often uh, gets worse. Uh, and uh, when we activate our public spaces in winter, we're support, supporting that social and physical activity. Uh, there's also a lot of economic benefits of winter placemaking. So extending the season, I know that in some places, uh, the summer season uh, tends to be really active where uh, local economy is um, a lot of programming dollars or events happen in the summer. Like this winter placemaking approach is about extending that uh, around the seasons. Obviously, uh, during um, certain events like uh, markets and Christmas markets are fantastic, but how do we again extend that to not just those one-off events, but that every day um, increasing the foot traffic, uh, uh, improving the opportunity to walk uh, in uh, local business districts. Um, there's a lot of really great advantages to um, doing winter placemaking. Uh, and then last but not least, obviously the social benefits of placemaking. It creates opportunities for community connection, cultural celebration, and joy. Uh, I really like that we zeroed in on the placemaking guide on cultural celebration and thinking about all the different ways that culture can be embraced uh, through winter placemaking. Um, and thinking about ways that you can engage different communities, uh, diverse communities in, place, in winter placemaking is really important when you're taking an asset and equity-based approach as is outlined in the guide. So how do we actually do winter placemaking? We actually give a really very clear step-by-step -step process in the winter placemaking guide. Uh, and I've just created this really simple, um, visual to show that uh, you know it's not a linear process like any placemaking process it's really about um, this kind of iterative adaptive flexible approach that is really rooted in again connecting people and place and thinking about the unique assets in community but also the unique assets and opportunities that winter uh, provides so the sort of top of the snowflake is taking an asset-based approach. An asset-based approach really is everything from individual and cultural um, assets to institutional and organizational assets, your physical assets, your streets, your parks, your public spaces, your plazas, your community centers, all of those things that belong to everyone in your community. Um, taking stock of those community assets and thinking about how you can leverage them to uh, invite more winter activity. I also think that partnerships and sustainable partnerships are a really big aspect of identifying those assets. What are those existing relationships and partnerships that you're able to leverage uh, to actually activate the downtown or do a program that gets people outside in winter? Uh, the second circle there is about basing placemaking on the need to advance equity. Uh, I kind of talked about this at the outset, but really um, equitable placemaking is, is really about engaging community directly in the process of producing the space and creating the space and having the space sort of evolve to the ongoing needs of community. Uh, you can see that next arrow is about engaging community at all levels. So that means community partnerships, your elected officials, your, your downtown councils, um, those, those partnerships and the opportunities to engage directly and identifying what are the needs? What does this community want to do uh, in winter? Uh, how do we actually 
have uh, events and programs that represent uh, the diversity of residents in our community? Those are the big questions to ask at the outset. The next circle is about testing community ideas and gathering feedback. Again, um, creating this feedback loop and taking action after you've engaged communities is really important. It's outlined in the guide or kind of 880 rules of engagement um, that we use when we're, we're developing inclusive uh, engagement strategies uh, with communities and cities. And the last circle is around strategizing. So some cities have actually integrated winter into their master planning process. Some cities have separate winter, winter strategies. Um, the important thing here is uh, that there's like clear policies uh, that can actually be supportive and facilitate winter placemaking. Uh, and there have been, from our experience, quite a few often policy barriers that make it harder to do placemaking in winter. And the guide breaks down those specific barriers and actually provides specific ideas and uh, solutions uh, that have been implemented in cities across North America. I believe there's probably, there has to be at least 30 case studies uh, in uh, the guide. Anyway, enough talk about frameworks and definitions. Uh, I'm someone that really likes to talk about actions and stories. Uh, so uh, I wanted to make this more tangible for folks listening about what does this actually look like in practice? Um, and uh, there's some really fun uh, examples that were pulled out uh, by actually Jane Armstrong, who's a project manager at ADD Cities, um, uh, pulled out some of these case studies. And, and uh, these are, I think, excellent examples of winter placemaking in action. So this is Houghton in Michigan. It's a community of uh, 7,800 people. They uh, embraced their largest public space, their streets. So again, taking that asset-based approach, what do we have? Our streets. We might not have the most beautiful parks or public spaces, but streets are public spaces. How can we use them to uh, activate uh, spaces and encourage people to come out in winter? So they transform these spaces into the, and this is the best name ever, the Jibba Jabba Rail Jam. Um, and this event brought locals and visitors alike to the downtown where volunteers the night before shoveled to make bargaining ramps, tube luges, and created a place for a ski competition in the downtown. Uh, there's actually another great example highlighted in the guide in Leadville, Colorado, where they do ski joring and they do a similar thing in their downtown streets, but it's uh, people being pulled by horses. It's really fun. Um, so this event in Houghton was a, a total hit for business owners uh, who appreciated the injection of life into the community during winter. And, um, you know, some rural and small communities may think that because they don't have an identifiable downtown square or a main park to gather in, that placemaking um, might be more challenging. But how to improve that with community support, the power of volunteers, uh, they could re-envision this public space in the winter, make, in, in, in the winter and make uh, placemaking a success. So that was Houghton. Here's another example of using uh, assets, using this community-based asset approach, uh, an equitable approach. Uh, this is Perry, Iowa. It's a community who really embraced their individual and cultural assets through the Perry Latinx Festival and Los Posadas. Uh, in previous years, uh, to, to the picture that you see here, uh, this celebration was held in the rec center out of town. Uh, but the town actually thought that it would be a great idea to actually bring it into the downtown. Um, and it's a, a recreation, they recreate biblical scenes uh, in which they go to business to business caroling uh, and uh, have food and drinks. Um, it's a very family friendly tradition uh, that the town has um, embraced with open arms. Uh, the businesses stay open late, uh, fire pits are added and it has become a community wide celebration. So I really also love that that demonstrates kind of the principles of placemaking. If you've ever read anything from Project for Public Spaces, the power of 10 principle, which is basically like the more that you layer on and the more things to do uh, when you do placemaking, the more attractive and inviting uh, the event and the program. 
Here's another example of a project that we worked actually directly on. Uh, this is in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Uh, they were one of our winter mission cities. And uh, through an engagement process uh, and a piloting process, um, they took community uh, feedback uh, and input to uh, develop a pilot project where they uh, priority plowed a trail that people could enjoy uh, the Chippewa River Trail throughout the winter, making it more accessible for people to walk uh, and bike in the winter time. This actually happened amidst COVID where people were also really um, uh, looking and, and seeking for out more outdoor opportunities. Uh, it was widely successful. The, the data that we evaluated or collected showed that people really use the trail. Um, and then Eau Claire also did a great program where they worked with their local library to um, uh, provide a gear share to folks. Uh, one of the things that they heard from community in the engagement process was that people didn't always have the, the gear accessible to actually engage in winter activities. They didn't want to buy something if they didn't know if they liked it. Uh, so they, they uh, developed a gear share out of their library and that's the shed with some of the, the gear. Some of it was toboggans, some of it was uh, snowshoes, um, but also some of it was uh, simple games to play out in the snow. Uh, here's one other uh, example. This was, um, as Darren mentioned at the top, and I know that uh, there's going to be a conversation about some of the opportunities for, for funding and, and action grants. Uh, AARP has been a fantastic partner to communities of all sizes, assisting them in embracing this kind of lighter, quicker, cheaper, uh, cheaper movement. Uh, if you're not familiar with um, lighter, quicker, cheaper, it's uh, out of uh, Project for Public Spaces. And it's this idea that you can do things with low cost, temporary, um, uh, low cost, low barrier and, and temporary improvements to actually uh, improve uh, places. This is in Milnocket, Maine, uh, the Katahdin Snowden, uh, Snowdown, sorry. Uh, they improved the local trails with the addition of a story walk for a family. Uh, the pond, again, this is the principles of placemaking. The pond was also transformed into a programmed ice rink and the local library, similar to Eau Claire, supplied snowshoes and skis for rent. Uh, warming tents, hot cocoa, and outdoor sound system uh, was added with funds from the Community Challenge Grant. And the plan is to repeat this event every winter. And uh, you know, I think that this is a great example of uh, the town embracing their organizational and institutional assets through partnerships with the library, their physical assets by repurposing the trails in the pond, activating it. And um, you know, winter placemaking uh, can and should be based on the assets you have at your disposable at your disposal. Sorry, uh, and we believe the winter placemaking guide uh, can be a source of uh, inspiration. I am not going to read all of these, but I just wanted to put this in here to give you an example. This is a screenshot of the guide uh, with some of the examples of the lighter, quicker, cheap, cheaper uh, examples. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a, over 30, I think, case studies of cities um, doing uh, winter place making uh, and uh, some success stories of, of what they've been able to achieve. In addition to that, the guide also uh, is organized around these four pillars. Uh, and under each pillar, uh, under each theme and pillar, uh, there's specific examples of uh, how a city has addressed the challenges that winter mobility faces, such as snow clearing, which is always something that we hear about. Um, and uh, winter fund and programming, how to actually activate public spaces in the winter time, uh, creating winter warmth, obviously cold uh, and um, uh, darkness is a big part of winter. So how do you actually create uh, more inviting uh, and light uh, warm places? And then uh, winter health and resources. So a big thing that we also learned from working with winter cities is that they do actually have a, sometimes a lot of, of uh, resources available to communities, but not always um, communities are knowing where to find them or know how to access them. So again, I, this is a big bulk of the guide and you can find out uh, 
what are the challenges that cities have faced and how they've overcome those challenges and the solutions to improving winter mobility, winter fun and programming, winter warmth, and winter health and resources. So in summary, I just want to uh, remind you that whether it's a food truck festival or you're using art to activate the public space in winter with light, light is a great way to activate a space in winter. Uh, design competitions, or you know, simply putting in a fire pit in a local neighborhood park with s'mores uh, or some paint in the snow. Um, people are really actually craving excuses and invitations to compel them to get outside in winter and enjoy the fresh air and physical and social activity. We've found in a lot of our winter placemaking work that there's a really big latent demand for winter activation. So my advice is to just try it and see what happens. And again, uh, sort of measure and iterate and, and build off of that feedback loop. After all, winter is an asset. Uh, you know, I talk about asset-based uh, development and uh, placemaking. Winter itself is an asset. It's a special thing. Not every city has, uh, has winter and has snow and has ice and has darkness. Um, and it can be a really beautiful, magical thing, in my opinion. And even if you don't like winter, um, we can all get behind more opportunities for everyday joy and connection in our public spaces all year round. So uh, this is uh, just, where you can find the guide, uh, you can find it on 880 Cities website or aarp.org uh, livable. And I just also wanted to let folks know that this is not the only guide that we've uh, partnered with AARP on. We have a whole collection of resources. Uh, one is the Parks and Public Spaces Guide for All Ages. And then sort of supplementary to that is Winter Placemaking Guide and uh, re another guide that we just recently published, which was addressing homelessness in parks, an inclusive practices guide. So that is it for me and my presentation. I just wanted to say thank you so much again for the opportunity to talk about this new guide and to talk about one of my favorite subjects. I will stop sharing and pass it off. I'm also happy to take any questions. Thanks, Amanda. That uh, definitely has my thoughts going on all kinds of great opportunities to, to bring to communities around Wisconsin. Jen, do you want to tee us up for sure, yeah. our next yeah. talk? Absolutely. So as you start to think about all these great ideas, and I know my mind is already spinning on, on ways of maybe taking a little bit of money and making a big impact. And that's what AARP Wisconsin grants are all about, small small dollar big impact grants. And we were really excited when we started to talk about putting this webinar together and offering incentive and ideas for creating great winter places. So we as the WDAC board um, with our partnership with AARP Wisconsin, are going to contribute additional dollars to the next grant cycle, which Darren is gonna tell you a little bit more about and how to apply. And these are dollars that are available for your community to embrace these winter placemaking ideas and really try to activate and implement within your own community. So we're excited to be a partner in this next round of grant making. And um, we'll let Darren tell you a little bit more about how you can apply. Great, thanks, Jen. So ARP Wisconsin launched its small dollar big impact grants in 2020. And really this was, uh, came out of a need I saw kind of going back to my entrepreneurial experience of how do we scale up that, that sometimes we get paralyzed because an idea we have takes a lot of money. And then how do we learn just to start small? And so as um, a gentleman that I follow uh, his podcast, Aaron Dignan, says it best, do a radical thing on a non-radical scale. And this really fits in with what Amanda was talking about. Try it, iterate it, learn from it, get feedback and scale it up. And so ARP's 
uh, Wisconsin small dollar big, big, small dollar big impact grants are done monthly. Um, they are a grant of up to $1,000 uh, to do just that, to help you launch that idea, to get an idea if it's sustainable, so that you can move it out there. Um, and really we thought $1,000, I came upon that number um, just because all my years in community development, I know that we have these ideas and people right away go to, this is gonna cost $100,000. This is going to cost a quarter of a million dollars or a million dollars. Therefore we do nothing. Um, and some of the best ideas that get people going can be done for $1,000, at least to get action going and, and starting in there. And so that's what we wanna encourage our communities to do that. Um, I dropped the link uh, in the chat. It's www.aarp.org slash WI for Wisconsin, SDBI for Small Dollar Big Impact. That link stays the same throughout the year. Um, these grants are received, the applications happen on a monthly cycle. Our next one is coming up fairly quickly. It's October 20th, but the great news is it's not a very complicated application. It really asks for four questions. Um, you know, fill it out to your best of your ability. One of the changes we've had to make at the request of, of our legal team at Wisconsin is they ask you to spend, or at, at the National ARP, spend a little bit of time thinking about how this will impact the lives of those 50 plus, since ARP is a 50 plus organization. Um, but really it's pretty simple stuff. Um, with that, we award the money. Um, currently ARP is doing two awards of up to $1,000 uh, a month uh, through the end of the year. Um, we have the one thing we do request is your project has to be ready to roll within 60 days. Um, so you only have 60 days to use this money. So if it's something you're thinking about for February or March, it's probably best to wait till, till January or February in order to, to make that application. Um, but again, it, you know, we see it as, as a good, this is quick, lighter, quicker, cheaper, as, as Amanda said. How do we roll it out? How do we do this quick action stuff that doesn't take a whole lot of time? So um, we're excited that WDAC has, has come along to collaborate with us to um, add more funding to the pot and get more projects done. And um, we think this is great. And I'm really looking forward to, to seeing some of these ideas roll out. You know, last year, one of the, the projects that I was most excited about came from Darlington um, in January, and they had created an ice lounge in their park. Um, and get out Adirondack chairs. And so I think with the, the funding of it, they never got the ice park, uh, ice lounge part rolled out there, but they were able to get the Adirondack chairs and get people at least, at least as a gathering place for winter. And so there's was a, definitely the type of things that we'd love to see. Thank you, Darren. We are also very excited to be able to add to that pot this time around and hopefully we'll be able to reach even more communities and making winter placemaking possible. So we want to thank you for spending some time with us today. We want a big thank you to Amanda with 880 Cities. Um, that was very inspirational. I know everybody's minds are, are twirling on, on what's possible. Um, I, I hope that you share your stories as well. And we are looking forward to a February webinar series where we can really present some of these case studies as to uh, what communities are, are really putting into play here. So make sure that you continue to watch because WDAC will also have additional webinars coming up um, each month. We're gonna have another one in November and we'll, then we're gonna skip December and we're gonna jump to January and February. So our next webinar is going to be on pop-up shops. And we're gonna hear a little bit from Madison on how they implement this strategy in their community. And looking- We have a question, Jen. So we can take this, this yeah. is for Amanda, if okay. you will. Great, thanks. So, um, question, first a comment, great presentation with excellent examples, of course. Um, what are some lighter, quicker, cheaper ideas for improving winter mobility for all ages? Oh, great one. Okay. Uh, so uh, I definitely encourage everyone to, to download the guide, by the way, because I, I, I'm serious. There's probably more than 30 examples uh, uh, that I, and I just uh, highlighted a few. But on mobility, uh, there's some really great examples um, of um, community uh, shovel core programs, if you're familiar with this, where uh, there's a matchmaking between um, uh, 
community members that have the ability to shovel uh, the sidewalks uh, for uh, residents that no longer have the ability to, to do that themselves. So great sort of facilitation and partnership of a, a shovel core team that comes out and, and shovels the sidewalks. Obviously, from our perspective, we would love it if the city prioritized the, the uh, plowing of snow on sidewalks everywhere from an uh, equity and uh, priority standpoint. However, um, community members have come together to uh, deliver this uh, themselves uh, and, and making the sidewalks more accessible. One of the things that we hear often is that a lot of um, older adults or, or folks who have any sort of mobility challenges will actually not leave their home because they are afraid of slipping and falling on the ice. So it, it is a really uh, an effective way to improve mobility. Another example that was highlighted in the guide was actually even just putting snow shovels in the transit stops uh, so that people could also um, clear the sidewalks around transit stops. So that's super lighter, quicker, cheaper um, examples, but I'm sure I'm missing a bunch that are also highlighted in the guide um, under the mobility uh, chapter. Great. Thanks, Amanda. I know even as I walk around, I'm, my office is at downtown Madison, and you know one of the struggles, the sidewalks are all cleared because the bid does that. Um, or at least there's a group that does that to clear the sidewalks off, but the crosswalks are always piled up with snow from after the snow plows come. So, you know, some way to address that I think is, is great. While the sidewalks might be accessible, you can't get across the street um, or have to wade through a bunch of water or, or ice there. So, excellent. Uh, feel free with uh, any other questions, uh, pop them in the, the chat, or you can even come off. We've got a smaller group here, so feel free to just come off mute and you can ask your question live. Darren, I'm just going to add in real quick that our uh, webinar on pop-up shops is going to be November 12th at 11 o'clock. So be sure to save that date. Great. Thanks. Thank you. And Amanda, I um, I guess I have a question as as someone who had the ability to get behind the scenes uh, look into the the placemaking guide. You know, was there anything that that stood out for for you all um, for 880 cities or the group that that you'd say was sort of you know a, a benefit or something excitement that you got out of it or an aha moment that that you uh, you had while putting that together? Yeah, I think. I think the big takeaway for me uh, when we were doing a lot of the winter mission work uh, and then uh, building off of that to this winter placemaking guide work is really the, the mindset shift of um, having uh, communities, you know, we say embrace winter, but it sounds, um, I think more it's like really embracing winter as an asset um, that it is unique and special uh, to your city. I think there, there's often this sort of like, oh, we're a winter city, like, oh, we have to deal with this. And uh, not to, to downplay the, the challenge that winter poses, but also I think, um, you know, in our work with the winter mission cities, that there was a big shift and aha moment uh, with, our, with our city partners in thinking about how to leverage uh, the unique context of winter. And winter is very different in different cities, right? So we have you know, cities like uh, Edmonton here in Canada, where they don't get a lot of snow, but they get a lot of darkness and cold. And so their approach to placemaking may be different. There's a lot of like light activation and, um, uh, you know, playing with uh, uh, with ice rinks and, and things like that, because they have a lot of uh, freezing time. In Toronto here, we don't get that cold of winter. Um, so we have a lot of wetness and, uh, and so thinking about how to activate public spaces uh, on your unique winter asset and, and climate, I think is my big takeaway from not just the winter mission work, but also looking at the winter placemaking guide. And actually Jane Armstrong, who really uh, was uh, the lead on the, the guide is here too. So uh, feel free to jump in Jane, if you had an aha moment too. I did, um, I wanted to share just how surprised and impressed I was by small and rural communities. Um, they do not get credit for creating the lighter, quicker, cheaper movement. It's something that's so associated with tactical urbanism and big cities and, you know, big, um, you know, urban design think tanks. Uh, but in attending a, a, an AARP rural lab presentation a little while ago, some of the small communities were talking about how they created a pop-up bike network 
with duct tape and bubble wrap. Like that is the definition of lighter, quicker, cheaper, uh, doing it as a community on a dime. Um, so there's just, yeah, like Amanda was saying, there's so much latent potential and demand for doing things in winter. Uh, rural communities don't get the credit for it um, and often don't feel like they have the capacity or assets to do winter placemaking. I feel you need the big cash, you need those winter markets. Uh, but there's so much you could do with building on your, your local culture uh, and your local institutional assets. A um, bunch of examples of folks uh, in small communities really relying on their libraries as well. There's an example of a community of 800 who partnered with a local library and a local outdoorsman to lead a whole uh, nature walk through town. Um, it's just those, those small things that the small uh, and rural communities, they really got it down to uh, an art, but they don't get the credit for it, which is something that we wanted to highlight in the guide as well. Thanks. <laughs> Great, thanks, Jane. Um, and I'd say, you know, a couple of years ago, I attended a, a, a talk um, by someone, I think it was the Grand Fork up in Alberta, um, who talked about winter placemaking. This is sort of the aha moment I had from there was, you know, for winter cities, don't necessarily spend a lot of energy into planning these big events because we truly never know while while people are winter hardy if it's minus 30 nobody's going to come so be ready with some of these lighter quicker ideas that you say hey you know what it's supposed to be 10 degrees on friday let's have something popped up there that we can roll out fairly quickly so i think these are, are great ideas okay we do have a couple more questions that are rolling in so um, from Kaylee in Marshfield, uh, are there any examples of large quantities of ice objects lanterns used throughout an area? In your opinion, how long are they expected to last in unpredictable weather? I know Burlington, Vermont did a really great um, community created ice lanterns. I think they had the community pour water into buckets and then, you know, create the lanterns themselves. Um, and that was like a super small scale uh, winter placemaking event behind a school at a local ski hill. Um, they used the lanterns made by the community to add light to the ski hill so kids could go um, tobogganing, you know, not in the pitch black dark. Um, so yeah, it was a community driven way to do it. It wasn't necessarily super large scale like your question asked, um, but you can always scale that up in the future once you've proven that it is possible to do such a thing. Yeah, I'd say I have a neighbor that does that around their house in the winter time. And they use like the battery powered tea lights to put in there. Um, and it just looks really nice. And if they melt, then you just re-pour more, <laughs> more ice lanterns. So it's a kind of a low lift there. So thanks, Jane. Um, I can add a little bit more to that yeah. from downtown Appleton. We do an, an ice walk. So we do ice carvings up and down the avenue. Um, we've been doing this for a number of years, but I will tell you when we hosted the February, 2021, ice carving walk, uh, people, the, the sidewalks were packed. People were so ready to get out and do something and they bundled up and it was one of the best winter days that we have had in downtown Appleton in years. And it was so much fun. And we, we even had less than we normally have. I, I think we maybe had 18, 15 or 18 carvings. And we have a local carver who does all of them. It's not a cheaper project. Um, it definitely is an investment. And they, I would say they made it about two weeks um, tops. And it really depends on, on what you're carving. If there are weak points to them where um, any warmer weather, they can get compromised, um, then you tend to lose them a little bit sooner. We did lose one that afternoon because somebody leaned on it and tipped it over. It was just great big guitar with the Mile of Music logo in it. It was super cool. I do have some good pictures I can share though. Um, so ice carving walks, just a real treat in downtown for the winter. So give it a try. Happy to share any, any information with you. Great, thanks Jen. And we have one more question, I think to, to take us out of here. Um, question is winter weather can be unpredictable. So planning around snow and ice can be risky. Any tips for addressing a warm spell or lack of snow when an event date arrives? Yeah, great question. And I, you know, Darren, you kind of alluded to that as well. Like I think just being uh, adaptable and flexible. And I think those, those lighter, quicker, cheaper um, ideas tend to be more flexible and adaptable um, rather than pouring all your resources into one or two big uh, winter events. 
Uh, I know that, um, and this really also connects to to thinking about the context of winter. Every every city kind of has a different winter identity. So some some cities have a lot of snow, and they can definitely depend on snow and and use snow to their advantage, like Houghton did, like you know using it as like actually sculpting and creating a new public space in their downtown. Um, and uh, other cities, I think, when you have a lot of darkness, you can play a lot with light, which is really interesting. And I think that, um, you know, even what Jennifer was talking about with the, the walks, like it's an opportunity to, to create a shared experience, a uh, shared cozy experience that I don't think you always get um, with some of those like summary events. Uh, there's something kind of uh, connecting about uh, being outside in the cold, but uh, in a cozy feeling with others that I think is, is, is special. Great, thanks, Amanda. And we, I think we have one more that popped up here. Um, this will really be the last one. For Amanda, where do you find the four tenants graphics you showed with winter mobility, et cetera? Where do you find the, sorry, what? Uh, oh, the four pillars, I think, the graphic that you, you shared um, oh, with it's the in four the guide. pillars of winter mobility. Excellent. Yeah, it's in the guide. It's all in the guide. Um, so each of those pillars has a, separate chapter if you look at the guide and there's um Jane feel free to jump in with any add-ons but um there will be under each pillar kind of the winter challenge related to mobility and then we kind of offer some specific solutions and even step-by-step -step guidance on where to get started um so some specific solutions around like what have other cities done to address you know snow shoveling or uh, a lack of priority of, of sidewalk clearing uh, or um, transit, things like that, and then it, um, and then it's there in the guide. But yeah, check out the guide. And then I also see that Scott Allen is on the line. Hi, Scott. Thank you for for uh, shouting out Eau Claire. Eau Claire has been awesome uh, and such a fantastic winter mission partner. We had so much fun working with that that team. So please do uh, look at owinter.com. I do wonder if Candice was referring to the graphic itself, where those four pillars were aligned right beside each other. In the guide, it's like separated by pages and chapters, like Amanda said. Um, but I can share that like combined graphic if that's what you were looking for specifically, Candace. Um, it's in I the guide too. I think I all I... together. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, as I said, I put it in the chat. We'll be sending up out a follow up email. So if there's anything like that, we can definitely get it out to folks too with with links to all of the stuff. Well, I think that wraps up our time here. So um, Amanda, thank you. Uh, thanks for our co-host, uh, Wisconsin Downtown Action Council. It was great to, to bring this here. Let's see these uh, applications roll in for small dollar big impact because we'd love to fund some of these projects. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation and thanks for Jane for jumping on too. Thank you. So great to see everyone. Take care. Take care everybody.